let's do this for a moment, if you would. Do you have a favorite song? Do you have a song that like, like you, oh, that's my song. Here comes my song on the radio. Or that's my song. I play that on my, you know, on my phone or my digital, whatever. Do you, do you have a favorite song? you have a favorite song? Yeah. Um, there is a, a, an Indian village uh, it, called uh, Kongthong. And it's not far from the border of Bangladesh. And there is a, uh, a mother named Shidap Kongsti. And she sings this uh, soft, uh, melodic tune. It sounds like a lullaby that a mother would sing to a crying baby. Seconds later, she hears a tune in reply. So you get this, she sings a tune, and there's a tune that she hears back. It's her nephew. Her nephew comes running toward her. The tune is much more than just some idle melody. For centuries, villagers have used tunes as their names. Mothers give each newborn a distinctive melody within a week of their being born. The Indian village encompasses about 130 households, a very small area. Locals never reuse the same tune, even after a person dies. Shidiap said, we don't know how it began. Our forefathers used these tunes when they went hunting, but it is highly likely that the tradition has very practical roots. Tunes carry distance carry over distance is much better than just a name. And I know this is true because in my house, I've just always been amazed. Um, Ruthie will whistle for our kids when they were younger. She would whistle for our kids. And they would immediately turn and look for mom. They would just, it, would, it just happened. It was, it was pretty amazing. Opposite... Uh, Shidiap's house, a 50-year-old mother of seven. She runs a grocery shop. In the article that I was reading, she said this, I know most people's tunes. When little children run past her shop, she sings their tunes lovingly. The village has a population of about 700, and she believes she knows about 500 melodies. Shidiap concluded with this about her four children. When they were babies... I sang a tune to send them to sleep, and that became their name. Only mothers can give children these tunes. It's out of mother's love. You know, Mary's reaction, Pastor Bryce shared about it today, Mary's reaction to the startling, the strange, this wonderful news of becoming the mother of Jesus it's a powerful example to you and to me of what it means to live this life in complete obedience and surrender to God, the God of heaven and earth. Would you pray with me? So God, there is a tune, Lord, that has been sung over human history. Lord, uh, it's a song that is unique to each of us, to all of us who are part of humanity. And God, this morning we're going we're gonna to take time to look at another song that was sung, a tune that proclaimed incredible news, but also gave evidence of a surrendered heart. Be with us as we continue to learn about this strange way you save the world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So time this morning is going to permit us just to take a brief look at this narrative that's found in the Gospel of Luke. And there are three critical observations that I think we can make with regard to Mary's story in Luke chapter 1. First, did you know that Mary's song was a song of surrender? Verse 38 <clears throat> from Luke's Gospel, we read these words. 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. In a different translation of this reply to the angel, telling Mary that she would be the mother of the Savior, here are words. Here I am, the Lord's humble servant. As you have said, let it be done to me. And in case you missed it, maybe you weren't here with us a few weeks ago, we took time to look at a different story about a long-awaited baby and the announcement that was given to this older, high priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And actually, it turns out in Luke chapter 1, verse 36, we find that Elizabeth is actually a relative to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they were told that they would also be having a child. And maybe you remember, if you were here, Zechariah's Zachariah's, uh, reaction to this news um, that he would become uh, a father. He said in Luke 1.18, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man. My wife is well along in years. See, the difference between Mary's response and Zechariah's response is incredible. Mary, in what can only be described as kind of this full-on acceptance of God's plan, humbly, fully accepts what God has in store with her and everything that would come with it. And while this particular part of this narrative is maybe separated, if you look at the verse, the chapters that we're talking about, there's a little bit of separation between her answering that she is willing to be the Lord's humble servant. There's some things she utters a little bit later on that show you how connected what she said then and what she sings of later are. But for reasons that seem to me to be incredibly obvious, Mary did not consider herself to be the center of this story. That kind of selflessness is amazingly beautiful to me. Did you know that uh, medieval artists often portrayed Mary in stained glass windows? You guys have seen stained glass windows, right? Right? And many times, her pain would be the only one in the stained glass that did not have color. It would be clear glass. All the other window panes would filter the light and sun through maybe their own distinctive designs and colors. But Mary's pain was often clear. It was unfiltered. There was nothing of her that would affect the light to come through. It was almost like They were helping us to remember that Mary would not advance herself and instead advance the work of God. I think about what we read about Mary here in Luke's Gospel and that these artists uh, had powerfully insight, powerful insight regarding the mother of Jesus. Here's a second thing from Luke's Gospel. Did you know that Mary's song was a song of adoration? So not only surrender, it was a song of adoration. She said this, very simply, in verse 46. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And that begins what's called the Magnificat. Has anybody ever heard that phrase, Magnificat? Have you ever heard that phrase? Does that sound familiar to you, the Magnificat? No, yes, maybe, not sure. It's okay. It's it's, It's literally a hymn of worship and praise. And the word Magnificat comes to us from what's known as the Latin Vulgate. It's this 4th century translation of the Bible. Mary's song that glorifies God is actually one of four hymns that are dispersed throughout Luke chapter 1 and 2. Uh, These are individuals who are responding to the coming of Jesus, and they do it by praising God. You'll find it here in this chapter, again in Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 72. You'll find it again in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. And then a little bit later on in Luke chapter 2, verses 29 through 32. Now, I want to be honest about something for a moment here, all right? The truth is, I wonder if some of us are a bit hesitant, too hesitant, to talk a lot about Mary. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of get, uh kind of feel a little awkward talking about Mary. I think we fear by saying so much about Mary that somehow we diminish the power of God, the person of Jesus. 
But as I shared before in this teaching series, the greatness of Jesus does not suffer because we recognize the incredible life and example of Mary. The truth is when we see the life of complete surrender and humble adoration, the kind of posture that Mary takes toward the Father in heaven, it's actually an encouragement. It's actually an encouragement for us to try and be the same way. Now, it's interesting to note that this adoration, this worship and praise that's directed toward God, it appears uh, in another place in Scripture, this kind of same reaction, another righteous woman in Scripture. I'll give an example. The mother of the prophet Samuel, who struggled. She really struggled to, to give birth to a child. In one instance, actually, while she was praying, for a child, she was asked by the priest in attendance if she was drunk because she was just mouthing words. And so they thought she was drunk. She knew the pain of being mocked, of being ostracized for not being able to have a child. And however, though when we read the book of 1 Samuel, we read that God heard her prayer. And she sang a song. Did you guys know Hannah sang a song too? She sang a song of praise and worship to God. She said this, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord is my horn, is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. I think that's a song. There's no rock like our God. That's what Hannah sang. And the amazing parallel between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Hannah, the mother of Old Testament prophet Samuel. It doesn't stop there. For in a very similar way, Hannah worshipped and adored the Lord to the point where she committed to give up her son Samuel to the service of God. Again, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, this is what she said. Hannah said, so I will give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. As we've seen in this passage that we're talking about from Luke, Mary, she did the same thing. She gave herself completely to God and worshipped him in the midst of it. So Mary sings this powerful song called the what? Very good. Mary sings this powerful song. It's a clear example of a life surrendered to the will of God. Mary also sings a song of worship, praise, adoration of God. But specifically, what this song that she sings is. Did you know that Mary's song is a song of testimony? She's telling a story. She's telling a story. Again, let's look at Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 51. We keep going a little bit further in this, this, this chapter. Mary sings, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So this hymn that she's singing, this Magnificat, Magnificat moves from Mary to those in Israel who believe that the coming Messiah is going to deliver Israel. Mary sings of, she gives evidence of how God's gracious mercy comes upon people who are humbly devout, like herself. You know, people who fear and reverently obey God. Mary turns here. And it's a call to everyone who would recognize her coming child as Israel's deliverer. Mary sings about how he, meaning God, has performed mighty deeds with his arm. And this symbol of God's might describes what things God's Son will accomplish in the future and recognizes the power of God as active in the past. In other words, Mary saw as already accomplished what God would do through her son. Mary keeps singing. In Luke 1, verse 52, she says, He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. And the rulers that she's talking about here are connected with the proud from verse 51 and the rich from verse 53. When Luke writes of lifting up the humble, or as King James writes, they translate, exalting the lowly. He's pointing out 
that this can be seen as obviously true by the selection of Mary to be the mother of Jesus. And when Luke mentions elsewhere in this gospel that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, it's a direct reference to this part of Mary's song. But in Luke 53, let's keep going. Luke 53, we read these words. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And I really love this thought on this aspect of Mary's role in the coming of Jesus. This contrast she sings of, the testimony of God's goodness. Nadia Boltz Weber said this, when Mary sings of God in the Magnificat, she didn't say that God looked with favor on her virtue. She didn't say that God looked with favor upon her activism. She didn't say that God looked with favor on the fact that she had tried so hard that she'd finally become the ideal version of herself. No. God looked with favor on her lowliness. And yet, what do I do but constantly curse my own lowliness? Berate myself for my failings and defects of character, for not trying hard enough to become my ideal self. But our failings, our weakness, our mistakes are God's perfect entry points. It is our lowliness and our humility, not our strength and our so-called virtues, where God does God's best work. Here's the last thing I want us to see from Luke chapter 1. Mary sings this. She sings, He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. Mary ends this song that she sung with certainty, assurance that God will remember Israel and as always, He will keep His promises to His people through the child that she will give birth to. Mary exclaims that God was being merciful to Abraham and his descendants. Young as she was, Mary was absolutely clear on the fact that the birth of her child was the fulfillment of covenant promises to Abraham and his descendants. I want to close with this. The fact is, Mary's song it's a song of disruption. The Magnificat is a song of revolution and of power. It is a song of strength in the face of injustice. As if Mary was not in enough trouble, right? She burst into this revolutionary cry. Mary burst into song because not only has God interrupted her life, but God plans to interrupt darkness, injustice, and poverty. God plans to redeem all the broken shards of life that are scattered across the dark world. This God whose favor rests upon her, this God whose love empowers her, this God who chose to use her, this God is going to turn the entire planet upside down and shake it to his glory. Anyone listening to her song at this time would have known that her words were aimed at Herod. Herod, the ruler of that day. He later hears that a baby king has been born and orders the slaughter of children under two years of age. If you come back next year, I'm planning on preaching a sermon about that, so come back in a year. I'm going to talk about that. But he orders the slaughter of children under two years of age. At the mere whiff of a challenge to his authority, he responds with mass murder. What would he have done after hearing the words to Mary's song? In a culture where freedom of speech was not welcome and death was the penalty for disagreeing, with leadership, uh, Mary's song was jarring. Scott McKnight, who's a professor at Northern Seminary, 
He says that for Mary's world, the Magnificat was what we shall overcome was to the African American community in the 60s and the 70s here in the United States. All of these things, when carefully considered, you still have to admit all of this. That's a very strange way to save the world. Pray with me. God, we do not pretend and we should not pretend to understand Your ways because, God, Your Word's really clear. Your ways are far beyond ours, but, God, Your ways are so incredibly filled with love. Lord God, we think of this young girl who gave birth to the Savior of the world and her instinctive reaction was to sing a song of worship and praise to You. Ah, Lord, that we might all have that kind of heart in living for You and in showing the world what it means to know who You are. God, as we, on this Christmas Eve, prepare like so many years ago was done to welcome the coming of the Christ child. Lord, may it not just be a a physical welcome that we are preparing ourselves for, but a welcome in our hearts, in our minds, in our very being. Because the coming of the Christ child, Lord, it changed human history forever. And eternity is now available in a way that is promised for those who know and love that Christ child who grew. And Lord, Jesus didn't just die. God, I was thinking about this. Sometimes we, we get to the Christmas story, the Advent story, and Lord, we talk about the ch- child that came, that was born to die. Yes, that's true. But God, if he was just born to die and that was it for us, Lord, we were to be pitied because that's not the end of the story. But it's the beginning because his death led to resurrection and the promise for eternity to all of us. God, may we celebrate knowing that as certainty. We pray this In your son's name, amen.